Um, let's see, Matthias, do you want to, you want to, um, since I've been here sitting here yapping and you've been quiet as a church mouse, do you want to introduce yeah. and get started in the next section? session and I'll get the slides going. Sure. This is pretty straightforward. I hand it over to Tom Fahey of Capital Meteorologic, uh, who will lead the session. Yes, we see you, Tom. Good to be here. Uh, need the next discussion on spectrum interference and weather observations. And I think uh, I just hand it over to Tom to save time here. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Everyone can hear me okay? Good. All right, wonderful. Um, without further ado, we're not going to do lots of long introductions here, but we have two really outstanding uh, distinguished scientist in front of in front of you here today to talk about these issues. Uh, going up first will be Jordan Girth from um, the um, there you see it from NOAA's National Weather Service, the Office of Observations, and followed up later by Sai, who will be talking, who's from Column Aerospace. Take it away, Jordan. All right, thank you, Tom, and uh, thanks uh, to the friends and partners of Aviation Weather for having me. Uh, as Tom noted, I'm with the National Weather Service Office of Observations. I'm also the chair of the American Meteorological Society and the Committee on Radio Frequency Allocations. Uh, if, you have any, if you'd like to get in touch with me after this presentation, please uh, feel free to do so uh, via my email address listed there. We'll go on to the next slide. So first and foremost we realize that members of the weather enterprise and of the aviation community have a variety of spectrum needs both for communications and for observations and spectrum use is ubiquitous in our enterprise whether you're talking about weather aviation and and regardless of whether you're in academia government industry the public uh, general aviation and challenges are inevitable costs are growing it's really no different than living downtown in a major U.S. city. You have noisy neighbors. The demand for wireless spectrum has you know, never been higher, and it, it's essentially a fixed resource. So we're trying to you know, part and parcel up the spectrum for various uses. And there's a lot of important uses out there, and, and, and we realize that uh, spectrum is a conduit for uh, achieving uh, bigger and better things in, in multiple sectors. For weather, it breaks down uh, like this. And I, I, I want this to really be my central message here is I'm going to be talking about two different kinds of things for weather sensing. First off is observations. So we have uh, you know high power terrestrial wireless emissions from 5G sources, 6G sources, in or, in or near spectrum allocated from Earth sensing will reduce consistent and reliable global weather observations. I'm talking largely on the global sense about weather satellites, although on a local sense, it could also be with regards to weather radar. Another problem, and the aviation community has been a little more active in this, are transmissions, and that is sharing of uh, space to earth. Radio frequencies uh, could threaten the timely and routine transmission of weather imagery and products. This is particularly from our geostationary weather satellites, and I'll provide some examples of that moving forward. And then what is the risk here? And that is, I think, inconsistency. You may have heard previously weather forecasts are going to go back to the 1980s. I think there's some there's some concern of that, that, but the more imminent risk is that when it comes to collecting observations and using those observations, if they're not consistent over time, the forecast we make are also not going to be consistent. So somebody that's a user of weather information won't know if we are operating with a complete set of observations or an incomplete set of observations, and then translate that one step further to how that's affecting the weather services. So if we go on to the next slide, you'll see an animation here uh, back one there. We use, we really derive a lot of different information that, that may animate, it may not. It's a quite a large loop, but the earth just goes around and you see various, there we go, different environmental parameters. And you know, 
we have rain rate information, precipitable water, wind, sea surface temperatures for a variety. If, if you think about the additional novel observations that cars, drones, smartphones are collecting now and could be a, a, a valuable to us, you know, we, we're going to have to use wireless spectrum. So we, have a, we use a lot of wireless spectrum now for the weather. Uh, we're probably going to, or a lot of spectrum now in general. In the future, you know, if we want to get better observations for, for drones from aircraft, we're going to have to use additional spectrum for that as well. So, you know, I really see this from both ends, and I just want to I hope it's not lost on anybody how many observations that we get of the Earth come from remote sensing and specifically satellites. So you go on to the next slide. So I'm going to be talking about the part of spectrum there you see from approximately one gigahertz uh, over to, I guess, what's uh, technically 100 terahertz, though we don't really refer to it. That's the visible infrared uh, and then SHF, EHF spectrum. So with weather satellites, we see in the visible, we see a lot of things in the infrared, particularly water vapor, and then in the microwave, uh, we're also doing sensing. And in, in that SHF, EHF area is also where there's wireless communications currently and where they are sought. So just an example of where we are within the spectrum space here. Next slide. So this is a general summary of the current spectrum matters for the weather enterprise. First and foremost at the top is L-band. And you've probably heard about some of the L-band issues related to GPS. Uh, but it's also a concern for the GOES-R, and the GOES-R is our geostationary weather satellite. We have not a data collection platform relay that's that's uh, near uh, 1675 to 1680. In fact, it's just inside, and then the GOES rebroadcast, which is near 1680. Uh, we're waiting F awaiting FCC rulemaking on that on that particular uh, piece of the spectrum for that's near our GOES-R. Uh, but the concern is high here. It's related to delivery. This is the transmission component. There's no good alternatives to provide a reliable and consistent downlink of geostationary weather imagery and remote data collection stations that helps uh, not only our academic, our government, but also our, our industry that's providing uh, aviation weather services. So there's been a lot of advocacy. Uh, AMS has been filing in, in the dockets. Uh, there's been op-eds, uh, coalition letters to lawmakers, and, and so forth. Now, there's been others. C-band, I think uh, the aviation community is familiar with that uh, for radar altimeter. Um, but that's the, the status is this 3.7 to 3.98 gigahertz auction 107 raised about 81 billion. Uh, fortunately, that's outside of where we have the NOAA port. Maybe there's some additional concern for aviation, but I'm, I'll just focus on where we do the weather information delivery. And then some other things that have been in the news a lot, K-band, 24 gigahertz a year or two ago, uh, and more recently, uh, some additional FCC action on what the proper uh, power levels and interference uh, you know, could be related to. That's an observations. If there's interference at 24 gigahertz, we're not seeing something in the weather. And then more recently in the W-band, 86 to 92 gigahertz, that's passive uh, remote sensing. All right, on to the next slide. So what does interference look like in the L-band? Uh, this is, this is a, approximately what it looks like. This is from the older generation of satellites. Um, we don't use as much anymore, but I think it's a good analogy of, of what happens. <laughs> Obviously, that's not a good thing. So we'll go on to the next slide. And this is what it looks like in the new uh, generation. We have these new mesoscale sectors. Goes R collects imagery every 30 seconds to one minute. That's a great capability for rapidly evolving weather conditions, but as you can see there on the right side, we lose a, a chunk of that image if, uh, if there's interference. And next slide. And an, another major application that I think is probably not lost in the aviation community is computing uh, winds. And in order to compute winds from satellite, essentially we track a feature in the atmosphere, in this case a cloud, uh, and you know, track it over three consecutive images, and that gives us a very good estimation of what the current winds currently are. This is a little blurry on my screen. I'm not sure if it is on yours as well. Maybe it'll sharpen up here. But, uh, you know, this day there was some turbulence in the area, but there's also uh, some very uh, good jet evident in the imagery. But as you can see there from the uh, red wind barbs, which are indicative of the height assignment. 
And if one of those images is degraded, it wasn't in this particular case, but if one of them was, you could see the, the challenge we would get with uh, getting that assessment of the winds. All right, next slide. And this is another case we'll have from over uh, Hawaii, or just north of Hawaii, I should say, using the water vapor imagery. And this has been one of the great new capabilities of the GOES-R series satellite is the ability to see gravity waves and other features associated with turbulence at about two kilometers. And you can see north in that blue area uh, or whitish area, you know, some wave type patterns. Yes, thanks for pointing that out there. And you, I think there's even a uh, PIREP report that, that comes in there. If you go on to the next slide, uh, you'll see what the Weather Service was able to do as far as highlighting uh, certain areas uh, for significant weather and uh, the, the benefit of the GOES-R data. So I show this just to point out that if we do have loss of data, these are the kinds of uh, services and the kind of area precision that we may not be able to provide or may not be able to provide as consistently. And then next slide. And now just moving on to some of the passive microwave and in in this is these are the bands that are actually sensing the weather this is not actually related related to delivery it's related to actually us seeing the atmosphere we do that with polar orbiting satellites and the polar orbiting satellites are major contributors to numerical weather prediction and if you go on to the next slide you can see this is not something new we've seen this uh, for approximately 20 years now uh, you see these little maxima, if you will, in the signal uh, over cities. You can see when the DC area, the New York City area, other cities across the country, yeah, there they are. And this is, you know, this is what we're concerned about increasingly at higher and higher frequencies. So on to the next slide. And I won't go into all of these, but there's a lot of different channels we use. These, they create a whole profile of the atmosphere and that profile you know, helps us in the numerical weather prediction to not only figure out what's going on at the surface, but in the lower levels in the boundary layer, if you will, and then up uh, near the tropo tropopause. Next slide. And so just to summarize the satellite interference impacts here, the delivery of satellite data must, also, might, must always be timely, consistent, and reliable. That's one of the premises from the AMS that we believe, and we've tried to, you know, uh, convince uh, FCC of that and, and the need to protect that. The value of microwave water vapor observations is not easily achievable through other means. We have GOES, we have the passive microwave remote sensing. It's a critical part. <laughs> if you took the water vapor out of the atmosphere, we would have quite a bit different atmosphere and, and, and quite different space for operating aircraft. And then continuing important observation uh, capabilities maintains the value of our satellite constellations and the quality of our local and global weather forecasts. And this goes back again to the consistency part. We wanna deliver consistent weather services. And because of that, we can't risk having intermittent interference in the observations we're collecting or we're seeking to transmit to users. Next slide. Now I'll just talk very briefly as I wrap up here about uh, NEXRAD, and this is our NEXRAD coverage. There are also terminal Doppler radars in major cities around the country, and this is the approximate coverage. Uh, most people are probably aware of these. Uh, next slide. So the spectrum that NEXRAD operates is 2.7 to 3 gigahertz, which is known as the S-band. Um, we have the two more, most common sources of NEXRAD interference actually come from the FAA or DOD ASR systems, which are on a similar band, or they come from cell towers, a 4G LTE, future 5G deployments uh, very much near the, the top. So this goes into that, you know, are you bleeding into your, your neighbor's space? Uh, you know, the, the, the radar signal, or excuse me, the wireless signals don't often stop right at the edge of their allocation. And this is the challenge we run into a lot with NextRed. There's of course other sources out there, uh, including other radars, television towers, uh, wireless internet service providers. Next slide. And so this is an example of what kind of interference you see on NextRed. On the left side, you see the Houston interference. Uh, from WiMAX, and you see that kind of radial pattern outward, and then 
something very similar uh, in the Norman area, uh, that multi-cell tower, <laughs> identifying where all the cell towers are nearby. And you know, these are more local concerns. Uh, there's a process that the Weather Service goes through to address them. Next slide. And so just to summarize our radar interference impact summary, you know, good mitigation of RFI ultimately starts with uh, proactive rulemaking by the NTIA and FCC. Uh, the NTIA Red Book does not adequately address the sensitivity of an X-ray receiver. I, any aviator, any user of, of weather radar data should know that the Weather Service is proactive in addressing those issues. But if you uh, have a challenge with a, a radar, uh, that it's it, you can reach out to the Weather Service to to, uh, to ask the status of of that. Next slide. And. That's where I'll wrap it up. I'll just note that as spectrum issues keep coming, we as an enterprise must be aware of the value of our spectrum holdings in dollars and cents and how, deliver, and how it helps us deliver better forecasts to the American public. I will say that the speed of science and peer review and making the case for these is slower than the current spectrum auction. So we need to incorporate an element of anticipation. And that's part of this activity talking to you today as I mentioned at the very beginning, demand for microwave bands in particular spectrum from one gigahertz, one gigahertz on up is going to only increase. I mean, so many of us have uh, wireless devices now. I don't think we see that going in the other direction. There's going to be just more and more connected devices moving forward. Um, there is a currently an NSF call that's looking to address this potentially, and there's an opportunity uh, to develop better expertise. So I thank you for your time today, and I uh, look forward to answering your questions. I believe we'll take those uh, after Sai's presentation. Thank you. Our next guest, uh, our next speaker rather, will be uh, Dr. Sai Kal Kalyana Raman, who's a technical fellow with Collins Aerospace. And Sai will be coming out here momentarily. Yeah, and Sai's yeah, slides you. will too, as long as I click the right button. Give me a sec. No worries. <laughs> well, while they bring the slide up, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sai Kalyandra, I'm from Aerospace. As Tom mentioned, my background's in navigation systems. Uh, I've been working on GNSS for about 23 years, and I support the Collins Enterprise and industry and in various capacities across the board uh, as a navigation engineer and a spectrum expert. And oh. uh, the focus of my discussion today, and essentially the pull on the thread that Jordan essentially set up, is the importance of spectrum when it comes to aviation systems. And we'll get into some of the details of the issues that we are facing right now in the C-band. Jordan touched on the spectrum auctions discussions in L-band and C-band. From our perspective right now, uh, what's a substantial concern here is the C-band issue where we're looking to show comparison between radar systems and uh, 5G slash LTE systems. Uh, before we get in there, uh, for those folks who are not familiar with the topic and uh, I realized that Jordan set things up really well, so you guys have a fairly good uh, understanding of this. I'll breeze through these initial parts. What is the main goal of spectrum management? We're looking to essentially ensure that spectrum is utilized in an effective and efficient manner, and we minimize interference. And the overall goal, when you look at it from an NTA FCC perspective, is to ensure that the spectrum is utilized to the benefit of the public. So that aspect is really important, right? For example, when Jordan spoke about the impacts on uh, weather observation, that is spectrum utilized to deliver value to the public. So as he mentioned, we need to look at what the value proposition of spectrum for your utilization is as well. And obviously on the other side, there's spectrum valuation that folks look at in terms of uh, POP. And um, that's Bob from the perspective of uh, cellular users. So from a spectrum stakeholder perspective here in the US, we're typically looking at, from an aviation perspective, the primary stakeholders being the FCC, the NTIA, and the FAA. Uh, the FAA does have access to a fair amount of spectrum in the L-band, and we are utilizing it in a fairly 
effective fashion. There's going to be a lot more discussion going on as we move forward in terms of what the value proposition of the FAA spectrum is going to be here in the outband as well. So that said, uh, moving on to the next slide here, the spectrum comparity concerns. I have highlighted some of the larger concerns that we have been looking at and discussing as we have been looking at spectrum here over the last decade and as we move forward. As Jordan mentioned, there is the concern between GPS and Legato. Now I should point out that the comparative between aviation GPS and Legato uh, has somewhat been addressed by comprehensive studies against certified aviation GPS receivers. Non-certified aviation GPS receivers have still not been addressed. Now there is spectrum comparative concerns between Iridium user terminals and Legato handsets on the upper side of the GPS band. This is between uh, the frequencies where Iridium operates between 1616 and 1626. And as I've highlighted here, the main topic we're going to discuss about is the effect of comparative concerns between radar altimeter systems and, <coughs> excuse me, impending 5D systems in the band below radar altimeter. Radars operate between 4.2 or 4.4 gigahertz. And as you all know, there has been activity and an auction has taken place where FC is auctioned about 280 megahertz of spectrum with 3.7 or 3.98 gigahertz region. Now, all the issues that we are dealing with are necessarily across aviation and other systems that are non-aviation. There are concerns in terms of spectrum compatibility that we are working through the right uh, fora, including IKO spectrum panel, uh, when it comes to compatibility between aviation systems. For example, there's a plan to have new VHF that's based on SATCOM, and we're looking to make sure that that does not impact the existing utilization of aeronautical VHF data, data links. Uh, there's a European plan to have a L-band digital avionics and communication system, which is what LDAC stands for, and they're looking to essentially fit that uh, yeah, LDAC I system in, slideshow. in the segment between the DME channels. And uh, the next item that I have over there is the 94 gigahertz electronic flight fusion system and uh, foreign object detection radars. So I know there's been at least one company that has uh, moved the FCC for a part 87 update to support EFVS systems that are going to help in approach and landing and uh, to be able to gain credit for vision based navigation systems. And they're looking at the 94 gigahertz range. And it so happens that that realm is the same realm where some other countries like the UK have been using foreign object detection radars for detecting foreign objects on the runway. So these are issues that are popping up on an ad hoc basis sometimes. Sometimes people understand that these are going to happen. Sometimes it's typically a question of, all right, I go put an EFPS system in place here in, in the US. And by the way, the English have a foreign object detection system that is operating at airports in the UK. I'm oh. fly my air. Sorry, could you go into slideshow mode, please? No, it's not. It's not size problem. It's math problem. And I see what I need to do. I'll be with you in one sec. Thank you, Bryce. Uh, I appreciate that. No worries. So, while Matt's bringing that up, um, when when you're looking at some of these cases where you have spectrum conflicts, uh, just because some of those items have not been discussed really well. You have to work through the appropriate for us, such as uh, frequency spectrum on the management panel at IKO to go ahead and address these issues. Now, as I mentioned in one of those bullet points, the penultimate bullet point on the slide, there are several other issues that we are tracking. For example, there's a plan for UWB to be utilized across the C band as well, and that's something that is concerning when it comes to utilization of radar altimeters, but we are looking into all these issues. And before we go further, I'd like to ensure that folks understand that from an aviation perspective, we're thrilled about 5G. We are extremely supportive of 5G, but we want to make sure that there's adequate technical criteria that is espoused to ensure that there's comparability between aviation and 5G or LT or any other IMT system. It could very well be something 6G, 7G going forward, but we need to make sure that the spectral utilization by aviation systems, especially safety of life systems, are comparable with these up and coming 5G or LTE systems. Next slide, please. And for those on the phone, can you guys see the slides? Yes, we can. Excellent, thank you. So we touched on this one a little bit earlier in uh, John's discussion. Right now we got 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz C-band section 
typically utilized for satellite spectrum. There are some uh, FSS links, but there are few and far between. And we have ARNS allocation, aeronautical radio navigation system allocation of the 4.0 to 4.4 gigahertz, and that is utilized by radar altimeters. Now, going forward, FCC is looking to reallocate the frequencies below the radar, and that, based on extensive analyses that we have done, have been determined to show that there could be impacts to safety of flight operation that utilizes radar for altitude information. So going forward, the plan is you'll have 37 to 398 will be 5G systems, <clears throat> and the satellite guys are going to be moved to the 4 to 4.2, and 4.0 to 4.4 will still remain aeronautical and radio navigation. Next slide, please. So from a timeline perspective, uh, we all know that the spectrum has been auctioned, raised a little over $81 billion, and as this auction was initially announced, uh, aviation met with the FCC several times before the final uh, RNO came out and uh, sensitized them to some of the concerns. And uh, the aviation stakeholders went back and worked through what's called the RTCA. And I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with RTCA. It's a forum, uh, and it is essentially a standards development organization. And SA239 is one of the special committees within RTCA. RTCA has several special committees to address different aviation needs. And SC239 is one of the special committees that addresses the navigation aspect and specific uh, radar systems. And the SC239 was tasked to go ahead and evaluate the impacts of 5G system to the low range radio altimeter. And that's what the LRRA stands for. And this was a go fast activity. And within a period of about six to seven months, we came up with a fairly comprehensive assessment of the impact of mobile telecommunications on these radar altimeter systems. Now, this assessment was limited to the impacts on radar from 3.7 to 3.98 uh, gigahertz based 5G LTE transmissions. We know that going forward, there's going to be more 5G spectrum utilization around the world, and we need to be cognizant of that from an aviation perspective because once I put a radar onto Boeing or an Airbus or any other aircraft, that's going to fly in pretty much all parts of the world, and we need to understand what that exposure is. But nevertheless, what we have done today is to address the problem here in the US and come up with an assessment based upon an understanding of how these 5G systems are going to be operated and a much clearer understanding of how radar altimeters operate in the presence of these 5G systems. So I'll get into the details of that. But that said, all the spectrum has been auctioned from a rollout perspective. There's a phase one and phase two. In the first phase, they're looking to start utilizing the lower 100 megahertz, which is the 3.7, 3.8, and the plan is to start operating around, uh, actually it's more like the second or third week of December, but still in 2021, and phase two is looking to utilize the rest of the frequencies from 3.8 to 3. Point, it's really 3.98, 4.0 has been put in there to reflect the fact that there's a 20 megahertz guard band at the top end, but it goes from 3.8 to 3.98, and they'll be using the entire 3.7 to 3.98 by the time December 2023 kicks in. Next slide, please. So I've been talking about radar altimeters here. I just wanted to give a quick 100,000 foot overview of how radars operate. These are navigation systems that are having their antennas bottom mounted on the airplane. Uh, typical air transport aircraft have at least two, in some cases, triplex radar altimeter installations, and there's a separate transmit and a receive part to the antenna system for each radar. So we're talking multiple sets of transmit and receive parts. And essentially, you're looking at a beam that's no less than about plus minus 40 degrees. And it's very fairly straightforward from a conceptual perspective. It sends a ping down to the ground and the ping comes back off the surface that it reflects off. And based upon the round trip, and uh, change in the frequency because this is a frequency based system. And I'm talking about the FMCW radars. So they essentially go across the 4.0 to 4.4 gigahertz band and they scan pretty fast. So let's assume that you're scanning at a point and there goes a ping down and it's the transmitter scanning and the receive comes. So when you go ahead and mix the receive with the transmit, you get a beat frequency and that beat frequency is proportionate to the round, 
trip distance traveled. So based upon that beat frequency, you essentially find out what that round trip distance is and half of that is typically your reading on what the height above ground is. So that's the really simple 100,000 foot perspective of how a radar operates, but there are some real life application concerns that come into play. For example, you can see that this aircraft probably has an engine that is right off the wing. So sometimes you get reflections from the engine. Sometimes you get uh, reflections uh, from wing tips, and these are things that we have to account for. There are situations where the aircraft is flying and you can have some underflying aircraft and you get a radar reading right off an underflying aircraft. So when you do a radar altimeter design, you have to account for all these things. Next slide, please. So the context of the work that was done with an RTCA in order to assess the impact on radar altimeters from 5G or IMT systems that are operating at 3.0, 3.98 is captured here in this slide. So the slide over here with the picture on the top gives a visual idea of the current state of spectrum. So between 3.7 and 4.2, we got FSS satellite systems, and these are lower power spectral flux density systems as seen on the surface of the Earth. 4.2 to 4.4 gigahertz is the radar altimeter band where we do the transmissions and the reception, and it's fairly self-contained system. And what you see in green is representative of the radar altimeter in and out of band filtering capabilities. And this is just a visual. It's not specific to any given radar altimeter. Uh, if you look at various different radar altimeters, the selectivity is different and there is some level of correlation to that selectivity across the user platforms. The air transport aircraft perhaps sometimes have more selectivity than some of the ones that are utilized on general aviation or even the helicopter platforms. So there's a swap C constraint that comes into play that drives some of these selectivity uh, aspects from a radar altimeter perspective. But that being said, in the existing context, as lean in the slide with the pictorial above, radar altimeters can exist just fine with FSS systems in the near band. However, what you see at the bottom is the future state of spectrum. And you see that you have these powerful 5G terrestrial based emissions that are coming into play. And essentially you're looking at a condition where there's gonna be overload. Now, the question that we've been asked in the aviation community from other stakeholders, aviation or otherwise, is why are you guys looking at the spectrum so far away? Why is it that you being exposed to spectrum that's over 200 megahertz away from your rate altimeter usage? Well, if you look at it in the context of what the near or adjacent band spectrum has been for radars, as evidence in the part of the slide above, those are low, low power flip spectral flux density systems. Essentially, we are going through a period of spectral rezoning. There is an understanding that there is some spectrum available in L and C band that could be re-monetized for high power LTE systems. However, when any such approach is being espoused, folks have to look at what systems are being used in the adjacent spectrum and the rationale behind why systems in the adjacent spectrum may not have substantial selectivity. So if you look at the radar altimeter today, the standards that the radar altimeters are built to have been developed back in the 70s. There was a TSO that was in the mid 60s, and the latest standard that is on the books today is in the early 80s. So between the early 80s and now, there's been a lot of technological development. We didn't have cell phones in the early 80s, let alone 5G. We didn't have 2G either. But that said, there is a substantially fast and evolving change to the spectral neighborhood that radar altimeters are going to have to account for. And this doesn't go just for radar, it's going to go for all kinds of aviation systems. So from that perspective, bottom line is these systems were designed based upon the standards that were there earlier. There was no specific need to have any adjacent band or near band selectivity masks back in the 80s. Uh, there were very few systems that were out there. So that was not deemed to be a necessity at that point, but going forward, 
we are working on the next generation of radar altimeter standards within RTCA and URK. URK is a partner organization, another standard development organization out of Europe. So we're actually doing a joint, what we call a joint MOPS development, and MOPS stands for Minimum Operational Performance Specification. So the way this works is you develop a standard, in this case, we call it the MOPS, and certification authorities such as the FAA and or EASA and other cert authorities around the world, they take a look at the standard and they write their technical standard order here in the US, we call that a TSO. That's what the FAA writes and the Europeans write what's called the ETSO, that's the European TSO, that essentially references back this standards document as the criteria for certifying safety of flight radio navigation equipment, in this case, safety of flight radar altimeters. So we are working on our beta standard, but that said, it's going to take us about two to three years to get the standard in place. It's going to take us a few more years to get some prototypes rung out and uh, do all the field testing and flight testing, and then to go ahead and certify that, and then start rolling it out into aircraft, be it forward-fit aircraft or retrofit aircraft. We're talking about a 10-ish year time frame before any all these radars can get replaced in the field. So that's a long window of time, and that is inconsistent with the rate that which, which was being was utilized being... for the purposes of 5G or LTE. And this kind of touches back on one of the items that Jordan was talking about. The next slide, please. So when we did this analysis with an RTCA, we had to go figure out how these 5G base stations operate. So we worked through what's called a uh, multi-industry forum and that was termed the technical working group and uh, there was a TWG3 that was set up to address the concerns of aviation and uh, telecom stakeholders. Uh, we had a lot of interesting discussions within that working group but the core multi-stakeholder activity that was taking place to address the compatibility from a technical standpoint did happen with an RTCA. However, when we discussed with telecom stakeholders at TWG3, we were able to get representative base station characteristics from telecom stakeholders uh, in terms of what would be representative of rollouts here in the US within the 3.7 to 3.98 gigahertz band. This is not necessarily representative of what's happening in France or Japan or UK or Germany or elsewhere, but this is generally representative of what's happening here in the US within the 3.7 to 3.9 gigahertz band. So I just wanted to put that slide out there for you guys to understand uh, what were the criteria that we utilized to represent the base stations when we did the analysis against radars when it comes to evaluating the susceptibility of radars in the presence of other band interference. So this table is representative of an eight by eight uh, adaptive beam forming array system and AA stats for active antenna systems. So 5G, as you may know, uh, is able to perform beam forming and it can have directed beams uh, into certain areas and you should be able to essentially track through. You'll be able to get a uh, higher uh, CNR, or you can call that SNR as well, the normalized bandwidth that you're looking at. Uh, so this is reflective of an 8 by 8 array. And as you can see over here, you have a variety of components, such as array spacing on the horizontal dimension, the vertical dimension. You have a range of scan angles. So we had to go look at all these aspects to figure out which aspect might cause an issue when it comes to comparability between these systems and radars. And we can go to the next slide here. So this next slide is essentially reflective of a 16 by 16 array versus a 8 by 8 array. And there's a variety of these different array systems that uh, 5G Telecom can use. So I don't want to dwell on this one. We've already spoken about the 8 by 8, so here we are. So having put all that information together, we came up with representative base station antenna patterns. And this is reflective of a adaptive antenna array system for the 8x8 system and the 16x16 16 16, uh, in the 3.7 to 3.9 inch headspan. So as you can see, depending upon the scan angle where you're looking at these beams pointing downward from a tower. So kind of assume a 30 meter tower and you have these antenna arrays at top of that, their service volume is typically in the lower horizon, the lower part of the uh, plane below the horizon and they would be pointing at different angles in order to figure out where they're going to spot their service volume. So typically how 5G stations would work is 
they would start with a downward tilt and you're talking anywhere around a, a three degree tilt or so, and they will start providing coverage in a larger volume. But once the density increases in terms of user handsets with 5G capacity starts increasing, they'll start tilting further and further and further, and they'll start filling in the areas that are left open with more 5G stations. Because as you know, propagation, and that's just physics, uh, you can only go so far with uh, the necessary ABN not uh, capability that you have to achieve at in C band versus L band. And if you want to push more data, you need more power. That means a smaller footprint where you can concentrate the power. So you have going to have some gaps in between in terms of where you were providing service, perhaps with a lower throughput, and you're going to have to go back and start putting those. So we looked at the minus 10, minus 20, minus 30 degree. Uh, scan angles, including the zero degree scan angle. And uh, what you see on the X axis on the top left plot is the angle from the horizontal. And on the Y axis, thank you for pointing that out, is the gain that you can get from these areas. As you can see, you can get like 24, 25 dBi gain from these eight by eight arrays. And on the top right plot, you can see that you can get close to around 30, a little bit over 30 dbi gain from these 16 by 16 areas obviously you have more antenna elements you can form a sharper beam and get a better gain and that's just fairly straightforward antenna theory now the interesting part is this is the pattern in the 3.7 to 3.98 gigahertz band now if we're, we're looking at two aspects when it comes to the impacts on uh, 5g uh, from 5g to radars one is the impact where you look at the overload, like the slide that I showed you earlier, where the radar is looking further away. The other one is what happens to 5G emissions as they show up in the radar band. Well, these antenna array patterns, we got it from ITR 2101. As you can see in the bottom part of that slide, you look at urban AAS antenna pattern in the range of 4.2 to 4.4. So even if you have an active antenna array system, you're not going to get these nice clean uh, multiple lobes in this band. And essentially it's going to look like a single broad element pattern. And this will be reflective of the pattern that we have to work with when we're looking at harmonic and spurious noise from the 5G systems that fall into the radar band. Next slide, please. So this is a pictorial of how we went and did the analysis. Uh, we started with the technical characteristics provided uh, by telecom industry, as you see on the left in the green box. Above that, we leverage uh, the industry standards and recommendations for aviation systems and telecommunication systems through the standard forum, uh, which would be the IKO for aviation and IT and 3GPP for telecom. Now, that is essentially giving you the input information for the study, but then we had a separate effort that we undertook where we had a slew of different radar altimeters from different manufacturers that were tested against 5G interference at the black box level. So essentially what we did was we took the radar altimeters, we piped in 5G interference. We also coupled in the actual return radar signal that would come from this box in a loop in a well calibrated setup to figure out at what point in terms of power levels from 5G systems to these radar altimeters stop meeting their performance characteristics. So once we came up with these empirical tolerance thresholds, we used that information along with the 5G characteristics that were provided. For example, we looked at the antenna patterns and we came up with what the pain thresholds these radar altimeters will have by rolling out these 5G systems in the near band. So we can go to the next slide here. So similar to the way we spoke about it in the previous slide, we came up with that characterization of what are the scenarios where we would have negative impacts to radar from 5G systems. And when we are looking at a variety of aircraft, we looked at aircraft that range from air transport all the way down to the smaller aircraft. So we had something called a category one aircraft that addresses air transport and air cargo. Categories two and three were general aviation and three were typically looking at uh, helicopter and lower flying aircraft. So looking at category one, this is the big air transport guys that carry typically anywhere between 150 to 300 people or even 400 people uh, flying into bigger airports. And as you can see, if you're using a 16 by 16 array with 30 degree negative vertical scan angle, 
and the aircraft is straight and level coming in an approach, you can see that for a distance of anywhere between 0, 0 0.4 kilometers, and for altitudes ranging from pretty much close to ground all the way up to 4,000 feet, you are breaking the safe interference threshold as determined by the minimally compliant radar altimeter. This is not to say every radar altimeter is going to have this issue. Of all the radar in this tested, some will do better, some will do not as much, but we essentially took the minimum performing radar altimeter and used that as the criteria. And when you bounce the interference against that criteria, what you see shaded in red, and you can see that lobe, that's essentially, uh, I think that's about the 30 degree on the vertical. Yep, thanks for pointing that out. That's the region where we think we'll have an issue. So how do you go ahead and address this? Well, we have some recommended mitigations that we put forth to the FCC, and we've discussed this with the FCC. It is to be seen uh, what's going to be done with that, but one of the inputs that we provided to provide to protect the Category 1 aircraft from uh, deleterious impacts from these high-D systems is to have an amplitude taper in the elevation above the horizon. So as we mentioned earlier, the service volume for the telecom is typically at horizon or below horizon. And what happened in this case is when you have a minus 30 degree vertical scan angle, you're essentially pointing a main lobe down here. What happens is you get these side lobes and grading lobes. And what you're seeing here is essentially a grading lobe impact. So if you put a amplitude taper and elevation on this antenna system, you can definitely go ahead and, and address that. However, that's not codified in the standard right now. There's nothing in the FCC authorization that goes ahead and says that thou shall put an amplitude taper to reduce the impact in the elevation above the horizon. So we're discussing this with the FCC. It is to be seen uh, where that goes. Next slide, please. So I spoke about the categories two and three, uh, which are the business aviation, general aviation, category two and category three is the kilo platforms. What you're seeing here in the slide essentially shows the solid black line that reflects the safe interference limit. And we apply from a safety of life perspective, a IKO 60B safety margin below that. And you can see that any of these kinds of antennas that could be used on the purposes of uh, providing 5G services, be it a 16 by 16 array or an 8 by 8 array or a sectoral array, whether it's urban, suburban, rural, that's going to cause an issue to aircraft that are in the user category two. And user category, excuse me, user category three is even more difficult to protect. So this is definitely a concern. We're not talking about 5 dB or 6 dB difference. In some cases, we're talking tens of dBs of difference. And this is something that is of a concern for aviation stakeholders. The FAA understands this. They are reviewing this and discussing this internally in terms of how they're going to address it. The FCC has seen these slides and uh, going forward, uh, we're going to have some discussions uh, at the industry level trying to figure out how best we can address this. And issue is if these systems start rolling out here in the near future, by the end of this calendar year in 3.7, 3.8, and then in a couple of years from there in 3.8 to 3.98, the speed at which these systems start rolling out and can start providing services is incongruous with the speed at which aviation systems can be updated and replaced. So there has to be short-term mitigations before aviation can go ahead and start providing some mitigations from the aviation side. Next slide, please. So what are the impacts that I'm talking about? Now, if you have, say, a case where you're not able to provide the appropriate correct altitude from the altimeter, and think of it as you're coming into a Cat 3 landing, that could cause serious injury to passenger and crew. That could essentially also cause the aircraft landing systems to deploy too early, uh, or it could impact the altitude at which the gains on the flight control system get applied. As, as you understand, as the aircraft comes in, you have the radar information coupled into the flight control system that essentially is going to drive certain gain stages in the flight control, and that is driven by radar altitude input. So if it has the incorrect input, it's going to drive the gain stage at the inappropriate time, and that could cause an issue from safety perspective. So when you look at the Category 2 and 3 aircraft, especially a Category 3 aircraft like a helicopter, let's say it's a medevac helicopter, 
and it needs to go atop a hospital building, go onto helipad and take back people who are critically injured. Uh, it's very likely that some of these helicopters fly atop hospital buildings and in urban areas, you're going to have another building that's going to have a 5G tower and you can very well be flying right into the main beam of the 5G tower. So that is a substantial concern as well. And then I'll probably be preaching the choir here, but when it comes to inclement weather, we have substantially reduced visibility. Pilots are going to have a really difficult time trying to land and a safe landing could be impacted when you're impacting the radar altimeter output. Now, there's two aspects to it. One is hazardously misleading information in terms of the radar altimeter providing incorrect values of altitude, but saying that it is normal. That is HMI. And then the other aspect is it would not be able to provide output because of interference. Both are not good. HMI is worse. However, if you're coming into a CAT 3 landing and you lose the radar altimeter, that causes an integrity issue as well. It's not just a continuity issue, but it's an integrity issue as well. Next slide, please. So we just spoke about 3.7 and 3.98 and the concern between radar altimeters and 3.7 and 3.98. That's essentially at the precipice. Uh, as you can see, highlighted over here and circled, we have the US 3.7 plan that we have discussed and the impacts on the radar. But from a global perspective, this is a view of the plans that people have. In some cases, spectrum has been allocated. In some cases, spectrum is currently being considered. And we are tracking this closely through RGCA and IKO, trying to figure out who has which plan, which frequency, what's the power level, what the emission criteria, what is the uh, maximum power density that we have to deal with, what kind of tower systems are these? Are these urban towers? Are these suburbans? Are these uh, small base stations that someone would like to put inside the airport terminals? So we're looking to track all that, but the, the big picture idea is figure out all these plans around the radar here in the next year or so, and come up with a comprehensive threat envelope in terms of power levels that you would see on either side of radars, and use that to develop the next generation radar altimeter mobs to make the radar altimeter more resilient than what it is today, and for the radar altimeter to be resilient in a future environment with this kind of signals in the adjacent band. Next slide, please. So that brings me to the end uh, from an efforts perspective. As I mentioned earlier, uh, aviation is looking to update the radar and standards. It's going to take a couple of years. It won't help the situation right now. It won't help the field at radars, but it will help the next generation radars. It'll take about 10 years to field it, about five years to go from the point of design development and all the way to field it will take about 10 years. Now, given the short time that we have for the rollout, a only viable path right now is for mitigations to be adopted by 5G systems. And as I mentioned earlier, aviation has filed recommendations on 5G systems mitigations with the FCC to protect the radar. This issue has been discussed at IKO. We have generated a state letter at IKO, and I'd be happy to share, share that with the, this group uh, through Tom. If you guys want to look at that, that state letter goes from IKO to all the participants of IKO uh, through the Chicago Convention to all the 193 countries. And uh, we have had discussions with EASA as well on this one. Um, bottom line is 5G is expected to operate by the end of 2021. We have to take action right now to keep trade altimeters safe. With that I come to the end of the presentation. There are some backup slides that you can take a look at in terms of impacts to radar. alt, but uh, I'd be happy to take any questions here. Over. There's a couple in the um, in the uh, chat room. Uh, one from Janet, uh, or actually two from Janet. Why didn't we start sooner? It seems like we're so far behind with how fast technology is advancing. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, we did not know what the rollout plans for 5G systems are. It, in fact, the only systems that we know of today are the ones that uh, are here in the US where they have provided clear information on what their plans for base stations and powers and antenna area patterns and so on and so forth are. For us to be able to go assess the impacts from adjacent bands comparatively, we need to understand the details of the plans across the frequency range. Essentially, we're looking at the range between 3.3 to 5 gigahertz. Uh, so 3.3 to 4.2 and 4.4 to 5. We need to understand what those plans are in order to make the radar more robust in the presence of uh, transmissions in the spectrum.
So that, as you can see, we have some information. We still have a whole lot of information that we need in order to go make a reliable assessment because we need to be able to get that kind of information before we can encode that into a standard and use that standard for a future certification basis. OK, and uh, Matt and, and Tom, I know we're down to about three minutes here. We do have two other questions. Do you want me to uh, read those real quickly or <clears throat> did you want to? I don't know how you are in timing. It's y'all's call. So, so, uh, so Tom, <clears throat> he, um, you know, you, you uh, opened this session. Um, uh, do you have any remarks that you would like to use to close the session? And then if, if it's okay with Cy and with Jordan, maybe we could continue the discussion for those who are willing to, to hang in there a little bit longer, if they can. Uh, I'd be happy to. There, there's just uh, actually two others then. Um, <clears throat> Janet also asked, will there be likely a plan then to stop the installation of 5G towers as a relate as a result of this aviation safety issue? Yeah, thanks for your question, Janet. Uh, what has been done, for example, in France, and uh, that is an example that we can use for reference, is the auction in France took place well before the SC-239 report came out. But once the report came out, DGAC, which is the aviation regulatory body in France, they took this report, they went and worked with uh, ANFR, which is the French spectrum regulator, in order to put limitations on what kind of locations and what kind of antenna patterns can be utilized, or at the very least uh, utilized, but reported and shared with aviation stakeholders and uh, the Aviation Safety Organization, which is DGAC, and with ANIFER in and around the airports. Essentially, a lot of words to say that they have limitations on where you can put these towers in and around these airports on the flight path. Uh, what kind of antenna patterns those towers have, they have to share that with uh, the Aviation Safety Organization and ANIFER. Um, as you can expect, this is not the most uh, thrilling piece of news for telecom, but from an aviation safety perspective in order to address the big iron aircraft, they're gonna to have to do that. So they did that as a phase one mitigation. They said, let's go do this right away because we don't know the exact impacts. This assessment that the Americans did shows that there is concern. So let's go put this mitigation to begin with. Let's take a closer look at it and let's figure out how we are going to address it in the long term. So the, as a stopgap measure, they put that limitation now there's a phase two effort that's going on where they're taking a closer look at the impacts to air transport, but they're also taking a look at the impacts to the other categories that I spoke about, which is the general aviation, business and regional, and the helicopter categories. So that is something the U.S. can consider. I'm not sure where the FAA is on that, but uh, that's to be seen. And, and related to that, uh, a question actually for me, all the talk is about cell towers and their location. Is the power from the cell phones themselves just too low to be of an interference problem, or is that uh, also an issue on this? So uh, depending upon the user category, that is a concern. So uh, if you look at uh, cell phone utilization on the aircraft, that is definitely a concern. We all know that they ask us to turn the cell phones off. We also all know, to be honest, that folks don't turn their telephones on just before the aircraft comes down to land. And that's something that the aircraft crew cannot police. So that being said, we, when we did the analysis, we accounted for some of these cell phones being turned on on final approach, and that is definitely a cause for concern as well for certain aircraft categories. And the last question was from Matthias, actually wanted to know to what extent could part of the money collected from the spectrum sales, that 81 billion, be used to pay for improving older standards and filters towards mitigating interference impacts? Uh, that's an excellent question, Matthias. I think there is room and scope to do that. Uh, that being said, uh, that would be an activity that would be espoused for the next generation of radar altimeters, and uh, we definitely look forward to working with Congress on that one. Uh, it has to go through the Congress process. Money has to be earmarked. There's just nothing that can be done here in the short term to address December rollout, but in the longer term to address newer aid altimeters, that's something that uh, we as industry would be definitely interested in talking to uh, the stakeholders about. And uh, actually, Dave Kochard 
Ashley did throw in one here. This is probably more flight standards question, uh, but are there minimum weather requirements for a pilot to utilize radio altimeter off airport? So that's probably for anyone there, but that may be more like you said, flight standards question. Any of y'all want to tackle that? Otherwise, that is the last uh, question that's in the chat that I could uh, spot there, uh, Tom. Hi, David. Actually, um, I have one point on the last on the previous question um, regarding um, uh, who asked the question. Oh, Matthias. Um, right. in, the last, in the last administration, former NOAA administrator um, Neil Jacobs was in negotiations with the FCC. Jordan, I think you're aware of this. Um, what Neil was proposing was for those satellites that are suffering from uh, interference uh, for, for 24 megahertz and also when goes, for those satellites that are being interfered with by Legato and other interference, that the FCC put aside a mitigation fund to help NOAA deal with the mitigation, which would address Matthias' question, but the FCC refused to agree to that in their negotiation phase when they were going through that last year. Um, I know that's something that Jordan's committee at the American Meteorological Society uh, on radio interference has covered. Jordan, you want to add anything to that? I'll, I'll just note, yeah, kind of a emulgation of the uh, two responses. It, it, you know, it, it's hard to plan for something when we don't have the full characteristics defined going in. It's easy to say, well, they're going to come. <laughs> You know, they're going to be looking at your spectrum to roll in high power terrestrial wireless communications. It's harder to know than, you know, is there actually going to be interference? Is this something we need to be concerned with? And also they do it in a very piecemeal approach. So, you know, if we looked at it from an enterprise level, perhaps there could be some trade-offs made, but because everything is considered in isolation, we have to be concerned with we, you know, what's going on in other parts of the spectrum and where we might have interference as well. It's a very, very complex problem. And, you know, I think Neil was trying to be proactive to get us to a point. But e even if we were a, a little bit ahead of these things, it takes a long time to swap out technology, it, you know, whether it's aircraft or whether it's building large satellite systems, which have 10 to 15 year horizons. That was one of the things we were saying uh, about the L band to the FCC was, well, if you're planning for something for 2040, you know, then maybe we have enough time to to equip, retrofit, whatever our systems that are using nearby. But of course they want to sell this and use this like, you know, in a couple of years, as I said, with the C band, I think it's 20, later this year to 2023. So there's a whole range of issues that we have to consider and, you know, we need a lot of specifications on both sides to know whether or not we'll have interference. And even with all of that information, it's still sometimes uncertain the degree of the impacts we will uh, eventually experience. Um, thank you, Jordan. We also have a lot of stone is just going through the last question. Are there any operational alternatives to radio altimeter uh, being examined? That's for you, Sasha. Sorry, search for the mute button here. Yeah, so uh, I'm looking back at the question here. It's a question on liability for 5G providers. So what we have told uh, telecom providers is, you know, this is a safety of life issue, and we want to make sure that people understand what that liability is. Uh, that is a very interesting question, and uh, the specific legal aspects, I'll have to defer to lawyers on that one. So this is a question of, someone who has access to their slice of spectrum and they are transmitting in their authorized slice of spectrum, but then there is a system that is looking into that spectrum. The physics limit how much of selectivity you can have today because the standard that was used to develop radar altimeters was from 40 years ago. So you look at it from an FAA perspective, it's a certified system. It meets the requirements. And then you have this newer FCC authorized system that is transferring its own band. So when you're talking about the actual aspect of liability, that's going to be an interesting discussion between lawyers. Uh, 
unfortunately, that's not a question I can decisively answer one way or the other at this but time. Actually, actually, Sai, we have an engineering question, which was, what are the operational alternatives to radar altimeter being examined? Yeah, so for certain phases of flight, there is no other system that can be used. So if you look at the aircraft instrumentation and you look at altitude systems, you have the radar altimeter that gives you the immediate real time altitude about terrain. Now you could say GPS gives you altitude. Yes, it does. But for GPS to give you actual height above terrain, we need a database that tells you at this X, Y location, what is my Z for that undulation? And then you have to go off that undulation offset, figure out your altitude in WGS 84 and figure out the orthometric height to that. So that's a derived altitude. Barrel altimeters, they're not as accurate as radars either. So uh, one number that I would like to share is a one to two percent accuracy. So if you're talking about coming in at uh, CAT three landing, 50 foot decision height, you're talking about a one to two percent accuracy. You're talking about a foot of accuracy. That's what you need to have in order to ensure that your touchdown is within that touchdown box. When you do the approach analysis and your uh, touchdown and go around analysis when the OEMs do that, they have limit conditions and they set some of the criteria at the limit and then, then do the Monte Carlo analysis to see if you're hitting the touchdown box. So this is an assumption that all those systems have that the radar ultimate is available and it's accurate to that one to two percent level as you come in for approach. And that is a key part of CAT 2, CAT 2 3 landing systems. Unfortunately, there is no other system on the aircraft that will give you immediate real time height above terrain. And, and the interesting uh, aspect is. Sorry, go ahead, say. Sorry, I was going to say the, the interesting aspect is irrespective of whether you have a single rate alt or a dual rate alt or triple rate alt, the threat envelope that interference imposes is common to all three. So even if I do a cross check of our rate alts at the aircraft, which they do in the integration, if the interference is going to pull the rate alt in a given way, it's going to pull all three rate alts the same way. So their parity is not going to help me there. Over. Thanks, Sai. Um, Tom, if I may, there's a, Gordy's had his hand up for quite a while, and I think he has a response to that flight standards question that came up uh, earlier. So, yeah, Gordy? just uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, just so everyone knows, the FAA flight standards is actively involved in this, and we have been since uh, early, late, late last fall. When we got the RTCA report. Uh, a group was established. We started evaluating the impact. Uh, we're looking at um, we're looking at the, the cost impact. Uh, we're looking at the uh, you know radio altimetry or radar altimetry, however you want to call it. Same thing depends on the manufacturer what you call it, right? Um, it, it's it's been Im integrated into the different auto flight systems uh, on the aircraft, and you start looking at the at how this is integrated. It it can be a tremendous impact to the point where you probably can't even fly some airplanes without it. And that is that is it. That is something we're trying to quantify right now, um, and and that's just on the big airplane side. We're also looking at it from the helicopter side and and looking at how it's integrated onto those aircraft. And like uh, you were saying, it's it's it, it's it is probably uh, the biggest issue we have going right now, uh, and we we have a crunch time coming up here, like you say, by this fall to come up with something. Uh, the administrator has been briefed. Um, there's probably going to be some other um, announcements here very shortly as far as what the impact is going to be. But um, in short term analysis, we're still trying to get our arms around this. Um, when you start looking at it from an operational impact, as far as diverting airplanes and things like that, adding fuel, there's also there's all sorts of ripple effects that this may cause. And um, you know, we're really, you know, we don't want to be the one crying wolf. But the fact of the matter is the RTC report has identified some significant potential hazards and the um, uh, like I say it's it's being evaluated, but it's uh, it's it's one heck of a one heck of a, a mountain to climb in a short short amount of time. Yeah, thanks. Francis. OK, that's uh, I think that's all that I saw there, Tom, <clears throat> unless you see any more there. Uh, back to you there. Oh, we're all good. Uh, 
over to the viewers and Matt. And I'd like to thank uh, Jordan and Cy for their excellent presentation. Thanks Very for good. your time. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, ju just uh, uh, both fascinating and sobering all at the same time. And, and so many thoughts running through my noggin right now about, uh, especially when Cy talked about the, the, the France example and then, and then, you know, why that would be such a difficult or why that is such a difficult thing for us to do. Just, just, uh, it quickly gets out of aviation weather and into all sorts of other interesting areas like, like socio-political systems and, 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 and all of that sort of stuff. And, and I'm just a weather guy, man. I don't, I don't want to. I don't know anything about politics or sociology or stuff like that. So it just just so fascinating to to think about it and and hear this. Anyhow, uh, Tom Jordan, Cy, uh, thank you very much for uh, wetting our appetite. I think and uh, and um, um, I I just I just sense in my head that there's maybe uh, maybe room for a slightly uh, a deeper dive into this topic, taking a little bit more time in the not too distant future. So, so don't go anywhere, Tom. We we I know where you live, and and uh, uh, th this worked out very very well, I thought. Uh, so um, from my perspective, you guys and Janet and Jim and your whole team, great day number one. Thank you very much. Um, I got to tell you, Janet and Jim, that hearing the comment, hearing Jim's comment about. Being at FPAW in 2018 and it being used to motivate, you know, not only today's presentation, but but a lot of the work that you guys have done over the last few years are help motivated. I, I, I that that really that that made me personally, not that I had anything to do with 2018 necessarily, but just feel very, very good about the sorts of things that an FPAW in its current instantiation can do. But I can also see in the in the area that that Jordan and Cy and Tom have have have, have given us, there's also maybe a need for FPA to maybe maybe be a little bit more strident, a little bit more vocal in in opinions that it, that it expresses. So to the entire crew that's left over here, I'd invite you to hang with us for the next couple of days, but especially the last end of the last day when Matthias and I will be talking just a little bit about about FPA organizational matters and including a notion that maybe would help us get to the point where we could do things like I've, I've just mentioned. So I'll, I'll just tease you with that and stop and hand it over to my good friend and partner in crime, Matthias Steiner, to close us up for the day. Matthias? Yeah, this was a long day. And also thank you from my side for everyone that was uh, involved in it in preparing for today's presentation and also executing today's presentation. A lot of good information that, as Matt, you said, uh, is keeping our brain active for a little while and probably smoke coming out the ears. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. anyway, we need a little downtime, I guess, but come back tomorrow for our day two uh, at the same time, 11 o'clock Eastern, to talk about emerging standards and certification challenges of novel weather observations. That is the main focus for tomorrow. And then we have a shorter segment again, this time with updates on ongoing discussion topics that we had in the past. And we get just snippets of updates as to what has transpired since. So that's the outlook for tomorrow. I hope you have a good rest of the day and we hope to see many of you tomorrow again for another day of FPA discussions. Thank you all. Thank Bye -bye. you very much.